So today we're going to be talking about mammals of Iowa. We're going to be primarily focusing on four different aspects of mammals. We're going to be talking a little bit about their diets, um, their activity period, winter strategy, and their status within Iowa. So just a quick introduction. Um, my name is Caitlin Brinkerhoff. If you guys have been on these sessions throughout April and May, you have uh, seen me quite a bit, um, but I'm the horticulture educator with ISU Extension Outreach in Region 5, so I cover uh, Plymouth, Woodbury, and Monona County with that, and I started back in 2018. Before that, I was the program office coordinator for Buena Vista County Extension, um, and that was in Storm Lake, Iowa, so I did that for a few months before transitioning over to Region 5. Um, I have an environmental science degree from Buena Vista University. I graduated in May of 2017. Um, so with that focus, it was um, a conservation education uh, focus within that degree. Uh, so I spent uh, three summers uh, being a naturalist intern for Dorothy Pico Nature Center, um, Woodbury County Conservation, where I actually got to use um, that conservation education degree portion uh, throughout my college career. So it's just a little background on me. I want to talk quick about two resources that I'm going to be using very heavily throughout this presentation. All the images that I'm showing are actually from our Mammals of Iowa field guide that we have. It's a um, collaboration with Extension and also Iowa DNR uh, that was put together with our wildlife specialist, Adam Janke. So it's a very um, fantastic field guide if you guys are looking for a field guide about mammals. It's a fairly small one. I have a printout of what it would be uh, but it's something that you can easily put into a backpack if you guys are out on hikes or anything. But it does cover the 57 species found in Iowa. It also talks about a couple species that may be uh, traveling in and out of Iowa, species that used to be here but no longer are, different things like that. Um, you can go to that link and purchase it and it can be shipped to you. Or you can also just do a PDF download if you just prefer looking through the materials. And then also I'm using the Iowa Mammals, which is part of the Iowa Wildlife Series that the Iowa Association of Naturalists put together. Um, it's just a smaller, more condensed version of talking about the mammals of Iowa. It kind of just focuses on um, a few rather than the whole 57 that might be here. So that is a free PDF download as well um, if you are interested. But uh, between these, uh, the presentation, I reference both of those quite a bit. So just to give you a quick breakdown of how we're going to be focusing on our mammals, I was kind of broken up into a couple different uh, physiogeographic regions. It has to do with their topography and their ecosystems. So we are really going to be focusing on uh, the Less Hills portion. However, a lot of these mammals go across to Iowa. And I will reference a couple that uh, may be in like the Iowan surface area of it just because they're interesting mammals just to kind of quick reference for us. So um, we're just focusing on that just because there are a lot of mammals. We're still going to be covering quickly <laughs> about 40 of them in this presentation. Um, so just a quick background on what a mammal is. They've been around for roughly about 160 to 225 million years. Um, so that's dating back just about to the dinosaur age. And there's about 5,500 in the world of different species. Um, and so you can see on the side of the screen here, I have a um, phylogenetic tree or a family tree. So you can kind of see the breakout of how all the mammals are related in Iowa. So this is just our Iowa mammals. And so it has to do with them all having a common ancestor and that kind of has to go out to their taxonomic breakout. So if you remember your domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, um, they are all in the same class, and then their order, family, genus, species is where they all kind of break out from that. So they all have that common ancestor that lands them into that same class. And so they, because they're all in that same class, it means that they have similar characteristics. So uh, mammals uh, typically have hair or fur, they have a live birth, they produce milk for their young, and they have two sets of teeth uh, throughout their lifetime. However, some mammals do stray from these characteristics, but they do all have one thing in common, or two things in common, I should say. Um, all mammals have three middle ear bones, the incus, the malus, and the stape, 
and their lower jaw is a single bone. So we are mammals. That um, breakout there that I have is for humans, the Homo sapiens, just to give you a little uh, background of that. So we do have that connective jaw and those three ear bones with us. Um, and the other characteristic that all mammals do have is they all do produce milk for their young. So those three things all mammals have in common. And just quick, I wanted to talk about the teeth of mammals. Uh, for me, I think it's pretty interesting to uh, look at the differences of the teeth for mammals, but they are all born with baby teeth or milk teeth that are later replaced with their permanent teeth. If you look at the teeth of herbivores, which are our um, plant eaters, they typically have sharp front teeth and they're used for cutting vegetation. Um, and then their back teeth are used as grinders, so they're more broad and flat. Uh, carnivores have sharp canine teeth, and that's used for grabbing and tearing the flesh of other animals. So if you have a dog or cat, you know that those teeth can be a little sharp and pointy. Um, and then omnivores, which humans are, uh, they have patterns of teeth with characteristics of both of those. Um, so for humans, we do have similar canine looking teeth. Um, we have large incisors, which are uh, front teeth, and then we do have grinders in the back. And then insectivores, which are insect eating um, animals, they actually just have a little cusp or a point kind of at the top of their teeth. So their two incisors are more uh, pointed and it's just kind of almost to grab their uh, food or their prey. So if you were to ever look at the skull of a shrew, their um, incisors are kind of placed differently under that long uh, nose that they have. And so how I kind of have all of our mammals broken out, I broke them out into their uh, classifications. Um, and I won't um, try to say the Latin names. I've never been good at that. I took an entire class about mammals in college and uh, the Latin names just were not my strong suit. Um, so in this category, we actually only have one mammal. It's the uh, Virginiana opossum, or just the possum as a lot of us like to call them. So for his diet, or their diet, uh, they are an um, omnivore. They're typically nocturnal, and they are an intermittent uh, kind of winter strategy, which means that they um, aren't as active during the winter. They just kind of slow down the rotation. They don't go into a full hibernation or anything, so you could still see them out in the winter, but it's going to be a little less likely to see them. And their status is also that they are a game animal, so that they are, um, they have a hunting season, typically, or there's a time of the year where you are able to hunt them. The interesting thing about uh, the possum is that they are the only marsupial um, native to the United States. Uh, which means that they do have live birth, but in order for those babies to survive, they actually need to finish their growing period uh, within a pouch that the mom has. So when these um, possums give birth, the young need to actually crawl up into that pouch. Uh, the mom does not help them at all, and they have to go into the pouch to nurse. Um, I think it's about three more months until their eyes open, they start growing fur and then they can leave the pouch. So that's just something very interesting and very unique to the possum only. That is not the case for any other mammals. Uh, something else that's really neat, they have 50 teeth, which is the most of any mammal in the United States. Uh, for reference, humans have 32 teeth, so that's just something to think about. Uh, for their diet, they do like to eat a lot of different things like worms, grubs, insects, birds, eggs, amphibians, and they also eat decaying animals, but they like to eat all those other things too, so it's not only decaying animals. In this category we have two, it's uh, talking about the two different rabbits that we have in Iowa. So we have the eastern cottontail, it's going to be the first one that we focus on here, so he's going to be on the left side. Um, he is an herbivore, he is nocturnal, shockingly, I know we uh, think of rabbits being a daytime creature, but they're actually mostly active during that dusk time or that dawn time. So right before the sun goes up and right before the sun goes down. They are active during the winter and they are also a game status animal, which means there's a hunting period for them as well. 
So some characteristics about them that stand out, they're a fairly small animal. Um, and if you compare it to that jackrabbit that's on the other side, they got shorter ears, but they're brownish in color with a white belly and a white tough tail with them. So small guys, they do reproduce like crazy, pretty similar to uh, the jackrabbit. So they are able to reproduce. Oh, let me check here. Pretty quickly, their uh, gestation period is only about 30 days. And any females that are born during that time can actually reproduce in that same season. So um, that's, you know, they always make the jokes about the rabbits and how easily they're able to produce. Um, for their diet, the things that they like to eat are a lot of broadleaf plants. They can eat the bark of trees and twigs. It typically just kind of goes with whatever is available at the time. Usually the shrubs, bark, and twigs, they'll eat primarily in the wintertime just because the leaves and grasses aren't available. Um, so you can kind of see that. There is some damage that they can do to shrubs or trees. And um, a lot of people get it confused with maybe damage from a deer. So it has to do with the angle and the sharpness. So if it is um, damage that could be done from a cottontail, it could be um, about a 45 degree angle and a sharp cut to those trees. And that's how you can kind of identify it from what would be a cottontail damage versus a deer damage for that. Now let's talk about the white-tailed jackrabbit. Um, this guy is actually only possible in Woodbury County. It's um, not a very common rabbit that we'll see here. Um, they're an herbivore. They are also nocturnal, also active during winter, and they're actually considered a conservation concern. So their habitat is primarily a grassland area, um, and with the loss of a lot of grassland is also the loss of the white-tailed jackrabbit. So their populations have been slimming down in size quite a bit, so we don't actually see that as much. It's more of a northern part of Iowa rabbit that we'll see. And the neat thing about them is that they do kind of have two different coats. So in the wintertime, they're a little bit more white colored. Um, and then in their summer coat, which you can see in that picture, is a little bit more darker gray. Uh, the big distinction between the two of them is that the jackrabbit does have longer legs. So you can see in this picture how much longer they are. And then also their ears are longer than the cottontails. And if you look at the top, the big distinction is going to be the little black um, coloration that they have at the top of their ears for that as well. So they have a very similar diet to the cottontail, not anything uh, too different. They also like broad leaves. Um, in the uh, winter time, they're going to eat the twigs and the uh, different types of shrubs. Both of them, well, the jackrabbit really likes open grassland. Uh, the cottontail rabbit has gotten uh, more used to the urban setting, so you see them out quite a bit, but they still like shrubs. Um, so thinking in the winter time in your gardens, you might want to keep uh, some of that debris around if you like having some wildlife in your yard. That's just something good to think about. Now this is our rodent category. It is the biggest category that we have of mammals in Iowa. There's 17 that are in Woodbury County, which I have all listed here. They're either present in Woodbury County or probable or possible in Woodbury County. I'm only gonna focus on a couple of them um, as we go throughout this. The first one we're gonna talk about is the 13 lined ground squirrel. So his name got cut off a little bit there. Um, he gets his name because of those uh, very pretty stripes that he has on his back. He's a little small. Uh, he does got a little tail there, does have, sorry. Um, he is an omnivore. He's diurnal, which means that he is active during the daytime. They um, hibernate and there's no status with them, so there's no specific hunting time or anything for them. Um, they have adapted to Iowa's agriculture quite a bit because they kind of like an open field setting, so they've gotten used to kind of the croplands around um, with that, and they also like shorter grasses, so they just transitioned pretty well in here. They're um, very active across the entire state of Iowa. Um, studies do show though um, that only about 80 to 96% of the, or 
as many as 80 to 96 percent of these squirrels die before they um, enter even their first hibernation. So the life expectancy of these ground squirrels is not very long in comparison to um, some of our other mammals. Um, their diet usually just consists of insects, seeds, um, fruits, and flowers. So they have been observed eating smaller mammals. However, I, it's just kind of whatever comes to them at that moment. So if they're having trouble finding food, maybe a smaller mammal will be something that they'll go over. But primarily it's the insects, flowers, and fruits like that. The next guy that we are going to be talking about is the woodchuck. This is also known as the groundhog or the whistle pig. We've got a couple different names. So they are an herbivore. They are also diurnal. Um, they, have, they hibernate during the winter. Um, and they also are a game status with the hunting period. The neat thing about these guys are uh, they can climb trees um, and they are one of the largest um, rodents that we have in Iowa. So in comparison to the beaver, I think the beaver is bigger than the woodchuck, um, but they are still fairly large. So you can kind of see the coloration of the woodchuck. They're this brownish gray color. Uh, they've got smaller eyes and ears, and that is partly due to them being a burrowing animal, so they don't need as much. It just Their eyes and ears will get in the way if they're burrowing too much. Uh, they really like meadows and pastures, and they hibernate in wooded areas with that. Um, and they usually do some burrowing in protected areas, and they uh, do summer feeding in um, open areas for that. So. They can live to be about four to six years old, but a lot of them are killed before then. It just has to do with the predator-prey kind of aspect of life with that. Um, they have an almost fully vegetarian diet. However, there are some exceptions. They do um, eat some insects. A lot of gardeners know that they you know, might come in and uh, eat some of their plants. They actually really like clovers. So if you have clovers in your garden, that's just something to think about for that. Uh, next one that we have on our list is the Eastern Chipmunk. Um, so this is a classic cheek stuffer, as they call him. Um, he's an omnivore, uh, diurnal, and he's intermittent during that winter time. So which means that he is just uh, a little bit slowed down in the winter, not as active. Um, could go in short periods of like a hibernation type state and he's under a no status. Uh, you can easily identify him by those uh, colorations that he has on his back, these little tiny ears that he has. Does have a tail and not a not a huge one or anything. When I talk about him being a cheek stuffer though, um, when they go out trying to find their food, they're able to actually stuff it into their cheeks and basically carry it around with them. Um, he's able to put enough seeds into his mouth that it almost doubles the size of his cheeks. So he's kind of a, a fun thing to look at when they're out and about. Um, but they're quite dependent on seeds, nuts, and acorns, um, which they store in the winter in these different areas um, that they'll go around. And it's usually dependent a little bit more on smells. They have been known to eat some different types of vertebrates. Um, like mice and frogs, uh, but they really enjoy more the acorns, the seeds, the nuts kind of aspect of things. The next one up is something we all know, just the fox squirrel. Um, also an omnivore, diurnal, intermittent, um, but they are a game status animal. So this is the largest and most widespread tree squirrel that we have in Iowa. It's found all across. Um, Iowa. Oh, and then just one. Oh no, never mind. Sorry, that's for a different guy I'm thinking of. Um, the fox squirrel in adult size, they can get to be about two and a half pounds at their biggest weight. Um, something a lot of people like to talk about is the white squirrels or the black squirrels, and those are actually just variations of the fox squirrel. And so it just has to do with the levels of melanin in the squirrels. So if they're black, it just means that they have an overproduction of that. If they're white, they have a decreased amount of that. So that's kind of what happens. And it's a little bit more um, 
variant on the location on whether you're going to be seeing those white squirrels or those black squirrels for that. Um, let me see here if I'm missing anything kind of interesting for those guys. They usually only live to be about three to five years old, which is a pretty good age for any of these smaller mammals since they're typically more of a prey item. Um, the bulk diet for the fox squirrels are going to be seeds and nuts, um, but they love acorns and corn. So sometimes that can be a little problematic for some um, ag agricultural places, or if you put out bird feeders that have corn in them, they are going to love that and it's going to be attracting them a little bit more uh, to the area. The neat thing about fox squirrels is where they kind of bury their food throughout winter is actually they find it by smell rather than memory. So they don't really remember where they put it, they just kind of sniff it out in their area. So that's just kind of a neat fact about them. Up next is one of my favorite mammals, uh, mostly because I was a beaver at BVU, so got to talk about them. Uh, they're a pretty historical mammal in Iowa and just the United States in general. Um, when the Europeans came over, they, uh, beavers became more of a trade item. So they were killed a lot for um, their fur and their pellets that they would make. Um, so just naturally over time, that kind of started to take a little bit of a decrease um, on the population. So they're valuable to make hats, coats, and other garments. Um, and so that kind of pushed, Europeans kept traveling into North America further and further to keep finding more and more beavers. Um, they're pretty easy to identify. The big thing about them is going to be that uh, tail that they have, that flat tail. So that's kind of used as a defense mechanism for them. They usually slap the water when they're um, feeling like they are in danger or anything like that. So that's the big point of that tail. Um, they are herbivores, nocturnal, intermittent, and they are also a game status species. So um, again, just as a reminder, that's what all of those little circles down at the bottom mean for their designs. Um, for the beaver, they, their pellets or their coats were highly valuable, mostly because of the fur that they have. It kind of is almost water repellent in a way. So you can kind of see that beaver in that picture is wet. Um, so a lot of people would take their furs and another mammal that we'll talk about because of that. Uh, beavers can get incredibly large. <laughs> they, are, uh, they can range anywhere from uh, 25 to 90 pounds, but they can reach weights of almost 110 pounds as well. So um, just some other things about them. They, um, inside of the Mammals of Iowa Field Guide, they're referenced as an ecosystem engineer because of the dams that they create. They also are creating other habitats for other animals in the area that might uh, live in that dam or might live in the dammed waters that they kind of produced when they were making their own home. So they're a neat animal found along streams, rivers, marshes, uh, different things like that. They have a smaller litter size, it's about three to four um, young that they have, and they're weaned at just about six to eight weeks for that. They consume lots of bark, bugs, buds, twigs, and leaves. Um, and they also eat some corn and aquatic plants as well. That's a little bit more in the spring, summer, fall time frame. Uh, but again, it just has to do with whatever is available at the time for them. The next one we'll talk about is that Plains Pocket Gopher. Uh, so the big thing that you might notice about that guy is his big old claws that he has. Um, this is the only gopher that we have in the state. And um, he is found in Woodbury County. Um, but he's not widely spread or found across the state. He's probably present most of, or um, you can possibly find him in most of the state. Um, but they're easily identified by those big old claws that he has. Um, their coloration, they blend in nicely with the soil. You can see if you look at him, you can, you can see where his ears would be and his eyes there. They're not very present because he is a burrowing animal. Um, so that way, again, they don't get in the way. Um, their eyes just over time have evolved to not, you know, really see at all because he's in the darkness. 
uh, so he didn't need that um, his eyes to see for anything so it just naturally evolved over time um, they're mostly found in prairies and grasslands and so you can kind of see if the soils around that it's a little bit more sandy so he can dig through that um, their habitats are beneficial uh, to in many ways for them and then also other mammals as well. It's highly based on the soil. Um, and so when they are actually digging through the soil, it's a great germination for other plants in the area. So it helps spread out seeds of maybe some of those native plants in the area. So I know usually when a lot of people hear about digging animal, animals or bur burrowing animals, they get a little nervous, um, mostly because they're thinking about their yards for gardens, but since this guy's a little bit more found in prairies, um, it's not as common in the garden, but very beneficial for um, spreading seeds in those areas. Uh, they feed exclusively on roots and uh, root systems, um, stems, grasses, different things like that. They don't typically come to the surface, but when they do, um, that's when they'll eat the plants or the stems of those plants. Oh, and they are also a conservation concern. So uh, that just means because of the decrease in their um, habitat, there's also been a decrease in seeing the plains pocket gopher. So there's no hunting allowed on that animal. I'm just moving on to another one. Um, I had to add in the Norway rat because he is an incredibly invasive species that is actually we think is native to parts of Asia or Northern China. Um, he's an omnivore, he's nocturnal, he's active during winter, um, and there's no status against him. It's mostly because he's super invasive. They are highly dependent on humans uh, for food sources, for um, where they live, their habitat, all kinds of things. Um, they're found in all types of settings except for natural settings. So there, these are rats that you would be finding in a house, in an abandoned area, or some kind of farmland, anything like that. Um, these are also the rats that are typically used in uh, medical experiments. They're, they can be bred to be more of a white color, what you think of what would be a lab rat. So they're, they're um, species of Norway's, Nor Norway rats. That is just way too hard for me to say. Um, then about fewer than 5% of these rats actually make it past a year of age. Um, there are so many of them, but again, they're a common prey item because they are so small. Um, so they can max out at about three years if they're more under a, a captive setting. Um, they eat pretty much anything that they can find um grain insects small vertebrates and plants so uh, you know if any kind of food spills outside they'll eat it if there's um, you know if you leave dog food outside for your dog they'll eat it uh, so just something to think about for that rat is they are they're very good at tracking things down um oh i mixed up my mice that i was going to talk about I was going to talk about the deer mouse, so I'm actually just going to skip my white-footed mouse. The funny thing about the deer mouse and the white-footed mouse, and that's probably why I did that, they are actually almost identical looking mice. Um, and so really it's a going down to an expert level is when they can really identify them. But they're both omnivores, nocturnal, they're active during winter, and they're um, a no-status animal. The next one that we'll talk about is the meadow vole. Um, so this guy is an herbivore. They are active during all hours of the day, um, active during winter, and they're a no status species. Um, this is one of Iowa's most common small mammals, and it's a major source of prey for a lot of raptors that we have. So if you ever go out to the nature center, um, the Dorothy Pico Nature Center, they do have a couple raptors out there. They have an owl and a hawk, so those two would actually uh, try to eat evil. So this is a mouse-sized mammal. 
looks very similar to a mouse or a hamster, but it has a pretty long tail. It's about two size, um, about the size of its back foot, um, about two of them. It, like its name says, likes to be in meadows, so that's kind of how it got its name. Um, but its diet is pretty much entirely plants. Um, sometimes they will eat insects, sometimes they might eat on decaying animals. Um, at high uh, densities, voles are capable of damaging trees and shrubs, uh, but that's if there are a lot in the area. Um, they are a common garden pest and they will feed on your roots of your vegetables or even occasionally will come up from under the ground and will snack on the stems and things as well. So again, this is a burrowing animal. So you can see that with the absence of the um, ears or this uh, smaller ears and the smaller eyes. Next one on the list is the muskrat. Guy is also an herbivore, active all hours of the day. Um, he does intermittent uh, during the winter time, so which means slimmed hours of activity during the winter and small uh, periods of hibernation, um, and is also a game animal. It's a medium-sized rodent. Um, and they usually live on uh, banks of water, so you can kind of see in that picture there he's kind of uh, hanging out next to some water. They've also got some smaller eyes and ears. It's got uh, similar fur almost to the picture that we saw of the beaver. So again, it's kind of to help with uh, not getting the skin of that animal too wet. So it's almost a protective coating of fur that it, they have alongside it. So again, found alongside lakes, marshes, rivers, different things like that. Uh, they can have up to three litters uh, within a year which is pretty interesting. Their uh, gestation period is also about only 30 days. Um, so once those young are about six months old is when they're kind of shooed away. Um, most of these mammals, I'd say pretty much all of them don't stay together for anything more than a year um, after they're young or old enough basically to get out on their own. Uh, they all separate as a family. Um, one thing that I thought was kind of funny within this field guide that they put is muskrats are prey upon uh, by minks, hawks, owls, foxes, coyotes, humans, and motor vehicles. So this is one that will be common that you could hit uh, while driving down the road near a river or anything like that. Um, so they do feed on a lot of aquatic plants, but they also will eat on corn and soybeans. Uh, but they like things like cattails and water, water lilies as well. All right, so next one up is an eastern mole. So moles are a fun uh, common garden pest that a lot of people like to think of. Uh, they're fossoral, which means that they are prime, they primarily live in the ground. They don't often come up to the surface like we see in these, uh, in this picture here. Um, one way to identify them, again, are those big diggers that they have. They actually point out um, so that they can kind of scoop out the soil when they're digging. Um, they can actually dig up to about 15 feet in a tunnel in just one hour. Uh, so you can think of how much they could be tunneling around. Um, when you see what you think might be an infestation of moles or like you see multiple mole mounds, it's actually probably just one or two moles that are in the area. Uh, they can make those mounds as they're tunneling through, you know, those 15 feet in an hour. So it's amazing what just one or two moles can do damage to a yard or damage to a garden. Um, this is an insectivore, which means they feed on primarily insects. They are active during all hours of the day. They're active during the winter and they are a no species or no status species. Um, if you have lots of moles in your area, that probably means that there is a large food source for them, which means that you might have lots of grubs in the ground or worms in the ground. Uh, so that's something that might even be helpful for you to know because it could be damaging to different parts of your garden or your yard if it's some kind of grubs that could be damaging the lawn. 
So that's just something to think about if you want to try to get rid of the moles, maybe try to identify that problem of what could be causing them to be there. Usually if you get rid of their food source, they won't be there. Uh, there's nothing to keep them around. Um, moles really like um, a little bit more sandy soils. They really try to avoid that rocky, heavy clay soil. Um, and they're closely related to aquatic loving species, but they don't swim and they don't like water. So they don't really like moist ground either. So that's just something to think about with them. The least shrew, we'll move on to our next one, um, is one of those insectivores that I was talking about with those little cusp of teeth and same with that mole, um, where they just have the uh, kind of curved tiny little teeth at the front that kind of helps them break into uh, their food source. So it looks like in that picture he might be um, trying to eat some kind of grub there. Um, they have an incredibly high metabolism. Their, their heart could be, uh, I think, oh, what, a thousand beats per minute, something like that. Um, so high metabolism. They're crazy, tiny little animals. Um, but they're active all times of the day, active during the winter. Uh, but these guys are actually a threatened species in Iowa. They are possibly found in Woodbury County. And, uh, but they're actually not found anywhere beyond Woodbury County in the northern sections of Iowa. So they're more of a southern um, animal or southern mammal. And these guys do prefer a moist ground and they're often found near wetlands, um, which again, just with the loss of habitat in the area is also the loss of this mammal as well. Um, with more of a reintroduction of wetlands into the area um, with different conservation efforts, there's a possibility that they could return. We'll talk about a couple mammals that are uh, kind of considered a conservation success story. Um, so that's a possibility for the shrew. It'd be neat to kind of see them kind of come back. Um, again, these guys primarily eat insects. Uh, worms and frogs. They might eat um, other amphibians and reptiles, um, but they typically like to stick to their grasshoppers and worms for that, for their diet. The next one up is the masked shrew. Ooh, my S's aren't coming out today. Masked shrew. Um, another insectivore, um, active all hours of the day, active during winter and a no status um, species. Um, so these guys are capable of eating more than three times their body weight. And I actually made a mistake on my shrew. This shrew is the one where their heart beats about a thousand times per minute, um, which is incredibly different from the resting state of about 60 for humans. So because of such an incredibly fast metabolism that they have, they have to eat enough food to keep them alive and they keep them moving around. So they have to stay active all throughout winter because of that. Um, the neat thing about them is that they can kind of turn their uh, body fat into heat throughout the winter so that they don't have to go through that hibernation state. Um, and although these guys are incredibly common across Iowa, you are unlikely to see them in person just because they're so small, they stay hidden away. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to think about that they're very common here, uh, no, no threatened um, aspect to them at all, but uh, something you might not see. Uh, these guys like to eat beetles, grasshoppers, crickets, um, and other types of invertebrates. Um, they also, they usually hunt under different kinds of debris, so like your leaf debris and things like that. Um, they occasionally will eat some kind of meat. Typically it's decaying animals and again those amphibians and reptiles and uh, potentially a small mammal but not as likely. Um, the next shrew that we're going to be talking about is the northern short-tailed shrew. Um, so this guy's kind of interesting because he can use um, some types of echolocation again because all the shrews are a type of um, they like to burrow, so you'll notice the smaller eyes, smaller ears. 
Um, and because of the not strong eyesight, they might try echolocation um, to kind of figure out where they are, find their prey, different things like that. These guys are also insectivores. Uh, they're active all day, active during the winter, and they are no status species. Um, and a lot of predators don't like to go after them because they are, um, oh my gosh, I'm getting so close to my time. Um, they are a very smelly animal. And then these guys, I'm going to kind of zoom through quick. I just realized that I just love talking about mammals so much that I am not moving through this nearly as fast as I want to. Here, a uh, bobcat is a great example of a conservation success story. So at one time, uh, they were kind of pushed out of um, Iowa uh, due to overhunting and loss of habitat. So um, at one time, they were completely out of Iowa and then they were reintroduced later on. So now they are considered a game species. Um, so they are a great success story after being reintroduced in the 1990s. So these guys are carnivores, eat smaller mammals. They're active uh, during the nighttime, active during winter. And then the coyote, another very common one that we know, is also a carnivore, nocturnal, um, active during winter and is a game species. This is one of Iowa's most top carnivores and something that you could potentially see out in the area. Um, they're often wrongfully blamed for killing livestock, but typically they're just gonna be feeding on livestock that could have died from maybe another animal in the area or some other causes. But they're very similar to a dog. If you were to ever compare the bobcat versus coyote uh, tracks, um, all cats um, retract their claws, so in the footprints you'll never see their claws. If you were to see a coyote, you could see their claws or like their nails inside of that track. So that's just one way that you can identify um, what would be a dog versus a cat. Next one up on the list is the gray fox. Um, not in high numbers in Iowa. They are a carnivore. Obviously in this entire section most of them are all going to be carnivores or primarily meat eaters. They're active during nighttime, um, active during winter, and they are a conservation concern. Um, again, something that you probably won't see around Iowa, and you won't really get to see the sight of them climbing trees, which is unlike any other kind of uh, fox in their category or inside that dog category. Um, let's see, and they're only about 10 to 12 pounds, so they're fairly small. The red fox is something that you probably will see or have seen. These guys are, they roam urban areas, uh, forests, prairies, all kinds of different habitat areas. Um, and they had a plague kind of hit them in their population in the 1950s. And then in about the 1970s, they were starting to recycle into the population again. So. They have a really good status, they're a game status, they're active during winter, they're nocturnal and they're carnivores. Um, so again, they eat um, smaller mammals and during the summertime, they might actually eat some fruits and plants as well, so, but primarily meats. Next one is the raccoon, very common animal. I won't spend too much time talking about him. The neat thing about him is that uh, little mask that he looks like he's wearing, usually that's kind of a um, defense mechanism for animals to kind of say, hey, I'm scary, um, also kind of helps them blend into the area. These guys are omnivores, um, active during nighttime. They do not hibernate, so they're intermittent, uh, just a little bit slower in the wintertime. You might see them out and about, and they are a game status. And then the least shrew is also just a carnivore, um, active all times during the day. Um, active during winter, but they are a conservation status, so that's why I did want to add that in there. Um, so their habitat is shrinking, which means they are also shrinking in size. And that's the same with the long-tailed weasel as well. I actually had the opportunity to hold a weasel one time. I was trapping for my mammalogy class uh, for some research. It was all live trapping, so we let them go. Uh, but it was kind of interesting to be able to find and hold a weasel. Um, I don't know if we were in a, some farm field, I believe. But a carnivore, they're active all times during the day, active during winter, and also a conservation status. 
the mink, which also has that um, water resistant fur. Um, pretty interesting. They have a um, ooh, uh, nice waterproof fur on them. They're a longer uh, little animal. Uh, carnivore, nocturnal, um, active during winter, and are a game status. And so different things that they like to eat are going to be mice, rabbits, fish, and they actually will also eat muskrats as well. So uh, just something to, I don't know, take with you. They also like crayfish as well, which is interesting. Uh, next one up on the list is river otter, which is another conservation success story. So this is kind of fitting into that uh, beaver category. These guys um, are native to Iowa, but were completely um, eliminated from the state in the late 1800s um, until about the 1980s when they were reintroduced. So between the 1985 to 2003, they were stalking them back into the United States um, and now that they have um, completely refilled up their population in Iowa, which is fantastic. But they were harvested primarily for that fur that they have. It's a very almost glossy type fur. It's very soft if you've ever gotten to feel a pellet um, of some river otter fur. But they are carnivores. They are active all day, active during winter, and they are a game species. A very interesting mammal to me is always going to be the American badger. Uh, so this guy, a lot of people know as being a um, rough and mean mammal. Um, he has his coloration on his face, also has a big defense mechanism as, hey, I'm a scary animal, watch out. These are little uh, diggers, so they can, they're usually burrowing into the side of a hill, um, and they are just as aggressive digging as they are in person. If you were just to run into them, they can throw their soil that they're digging up or their dirt about four to five feet in the air when they're digging. Uh, but they're a carnivore, nocturnal, intermittent during that winter time, and they are a game species. Next one up on the list is everyone's favorite is a striped skunk. So that is a big warning sign that the skunk has on his back with the white stripe down the back. We actually have two different types of skunks in Iowa, but I'm just gonna talk about the striped one. Uh, these guys are omnivores. Uh, they're active during nighttime, um, intermittent during the winter time, and they are also a game species. So we know skunks as a spraying animal, but usually they'll do a couple other warning signs before that. They'll lift up the, their tail, they'll kind of huff at you, slam their feet on the ground, they'll do all of that before they actually spray. So spraying is the last thing that they'll do. So if you ever run into a skunk in that situation, just try to leave. They'll probably not spray before then. So, um, And they're kind of a lonely animal. They prefer to be alone, um, but they've also been known to carry rabies. So that's th something to think about if you ever come in contact with a skunk. Um, try not to touch it. I know a lot of times people will they have the urge to want to pick up animals or pick up baby animals. Just try to leave them alone if you can. Uh, something I added in for fun is the black bear. So the black bear was native to Iowa at one point, uh, was eliminated from the state in 1876 due to um, overhunting. And just kind of over time, they've made their way back into Iowa. And this is over in Northeast Iowa. Um, but not a lot of people know that black bears were native to Iowa, so I just wanted to kind of toss them in. Uh, these guys do hibernate during winter, so that's the big difference between um, them and the skunk. They are no status uh, species because they've just over time become a, um, not necessarily like a mammal of Iowa, yet they are. So I just wanted to add him in for fun. And I just have one guy in this category, it's the white-tailed deer. Uh, so this category has to do with their feet um, and their hooves, basically. So that's kind of what uh, puts the deer into their own categories. Uh, the white-tailed deer, everybody knows they get their name from their white tail that they usually flip up um, to warn any other deer that they are with that there is some kind of danger around them. Uh, so typically, if they're just walking around, their tail will be down like it is in this picture. Um, and then if they feel that they are in danger, they'll flip that up. Um, again, these guys are another success story because at one time they were um, functionally 
extirpated uh, from Iowa just means that they were um, eliminated from the state of Iowa. And that was in the turn of the 20th century that that happened. And again, uh, throughout conservation efforts, uh, the population was reintroduced uh, to the point that I know a lot of people get very frustrated with deers in their yard. Um, but that's why there is an open hunting season for deer to kind of help control uh, the population of them. So I know sometimes hunting can be a little bit of a um, touchy subject for people, but in cases like deer to help control the population without eliminating it or letting it take over it is a really great thing there. But they're on, uh, actually herbivores. They're active all day, active during winter, and they're a game species now. And now one of my favorite categories, I probably have said that about all of them, is the bat category. So there's eight different bats found in Woodbury County. I'm going to talk about four really quick. Um, we have the big brown bat and then the little brown bat. Uh, despite their names being similar, they're actually in two different um, genus categories. Um, so they are both um, insectivores, nocturnal, and they hibernate. The brown bat the big brown bat is a no status species. However, the little brown bat is a conservation concern. Um, the big thing about them that's different is of course their size. The big brown bat's gonna be bigger than the little one. Uh, big brown bat is one of the largest bats in Iowa. They get to be about an eighth of an ounce. So just a, they're very small mammals and they're the only flying mammals that we have. Um, so not all mammals fly. Uh, there are some swimming mammals as well, so mammals are a very broad category. Um, let me see here. They like to eat on uh, different hard body insects, um, and they're actually very important to uh, the agriculture of Iowa because they will eat the cucumber beetles, stink bugs, and leaf hoppers that attack a lot of our gardens. So that's something to think about, and that happens with all of our other bats as well. So with the little brown bat being a conservation concern, again, this just has to do with a lot of habitat loss for them. Our last two ones are the ornery bat and the eastern red bat. Um, and these guys are similar. These are both migrating bats. So they are only here for a little bit. Typically it's the females. They come um, give birth here. They raise their young here until the young are able to go out on their own. Uh, neat distinctions between them are their coloration. So the eastern red bat, of course, is a little bit more of that red color, and the hornery bat is has those nice uh, colorations on them. Um, the hornery bat is a bigger bat than the eastern red bat is. Um, so that guy is, I think, the biggest one that we have in um, Iowa. He gets to be about uh, 15 inches wide for a wingspan and he's 1.25 ounces at an adult stage. So just a neat thing for that. All right, so that was all my mammals. Sorry, I'm kind of running through on time here. Um, but a big thing that we like to think about as gardeners are mammals being a problem in the area. So here I have a flow chart that our wildlife specialist, Adam Janke put together that I think is just a fantastic one. Um, about how annoying an animal is and then how to take the care of, how to take care of it. Um, so just ask yourself, how annoying is this animal? Yeah, if it's not very annoying, yeah, then you just gotta live with that. One quote that I took from the wildlife series um, Iowa Mammals uh, article was, we tend to consider certain animals nuisances when they interact with people in ways we don't like or consider dangerous. So just because we don't like them, we automatically find them to be a problem. Um, but all animals need food, water, shelter, and space. So if we take away those pieces in our yards or gardens, um, it's gonna help keep those mammals out. Um, thinking about moles dick up our lawns and deers and squirrels damage ag crops, you know, a lot of those mammals can cause problems, but if there's a way that we can kind of remove them out, uh, that's fantastic. If you think about, um, for some of the smaller herbaceous animals, they might, if you put plants or something on the outside of your garden that they don't like, they might not feel like going into the garden to find anything else. They run into that and they go, oh, I don't like this. I don't want to eat anymore. Um, 
And because sometimes they can be a problem, they can sometimes have an economic impact, you know, if they are eating different crops and things like that. Uh, a quick way to figure out how to take care of it is figuring out what can be avoided to remove those mammals from the um, area. Here's just another little chart that I think is really helpful, um, is what's making the holes in the yard. So a lot of people are always right away, they're like, I have voles. Well, okay, you might, uh, but you could also have a groundhog, you could have um, some raccoon feeding areas, just different things like that. So this is a really great um, little flow chart to have to kind of help identify what could be in the yard. And then as master gardeners, just having that knowledge um, in your back pocket when somebody um, might ask you a question about that is just great as well. And then I did just want to um, introduce you guys to Adam Janke. He's our Iowa Extension Wildlife Specialist. Um, and he's also an assistant professor for Iowa State. So he has a really helpful website that I'll go over in just a minute here. I'll go a little over time just to show you the website. Um, but he's put that together in his past couple of years of being here. He also just uh, restarted the Master Conservationist Program that we held in Woodbury County for the first time last year. Um, it's been about 10 years since they had held it. Um, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about conservation um, and learning a little bit more about um, the conservation efforts that went into helping reintroduce some of these mammals into the area, uh, just let me know. We're going to be hope hopefully hosting another class sometime soon. And then again, I just wanted to add in my information here for you guys. Um, feel free to reach out anytime, uh, email um, or phone. I am in the office, um, but we are answering the phone here and there right now just because we are technically closed to the public. So always feel free to uh, reach out to me via email during this time. So I'm going to quick stop sharing my screen and I am going to pull up Adam's website and I'm going to show you that. And then I did see that Carol did put the evaluation link into um, the chat box. So make sure to go ahead and fill that out. Sorry, I kind of had to rush through the last couple things. I just really enjoy mammals and plants. Um, so here, can everybody see the website that I have pulled up? Yes. Awesome. So if you were to go to the naturalresources.extension.iastate/wildlife, um, you can find our wildlife page. And then here we have lots of information for you. Um, but the big thing is, is if you are looking for problem wildlife. Um, as gardeners, this is where we are going to be using a lot of this information right here. Um, such as deer damage to trees and gardens or burrowing animals. So um, Adam has put together some information on how to deal with wildlife in the yard or if you're looking at trying to landscape to provide a better habitat for wildlife in your area, maybe you are looking to attract more wildlife. And he has a whole presentation and um, information about that as well as well as over here, just some additional information. And then if you're ever looking at finding contacts for um, wildlife, um, maybe rehabbers, if you found an injured um, mammal, anything like that, if you go here, you can actually track down um, some of those info, you know, wildlife rehabilitation, um, habitat programs, different things like that. So it's a very uh, nice website. This is just one example of the burrowing animals, how you can take care of that, and then vertebrates in the garden. So that's all I have for my presentation. Does anybody have any questions for me at all? Caitlin, I don't necessarily have a question, but I loved the chart that you had of how to look at the yard and see kind of what animal it is, because now I definitely know that I have a groundhog looking at that. <laughs> yep. Um, so that I, that's the big thing to trying to figure out how to uh, solve your mammal problem or any kind of problem that you're having in your garden is trying to identify it first before going, oh, I think it's this, you know, looking at the size of the hole, measuring it out. Um, you know, in that picture, they had the example of the softball next to one of the holes or a golf ball, different things like that. So that can be helpful as well. 
Sounds great. It was a great presentation. I enjoyed listening to it and I'm going to check out that website. I, uh, UNL has a website about wildlife also, but I think both of them would be really good for me to look at when I look for how to help move him to a different spot. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And then if you guys want um, links to any of that, uh, just let me know. You can go ahead and send me an email. Um, if you message on the Sealand Garden Show website, I'll get those emails as well. Um, or if you go to the extension website, it will direct you to me as well. So if you need any help tracking down any of that information, just let me know.